COVID-19 pandemic, Professor Rocco Drizzolini and single-use and reusable broccoscope, advantage of using single-use broccoscope by Professor Eric van der Heiden, and how to manage, how to minimize the contamination risk and increase the availability of the reusable scope by Professor Rocco Trisolini. And at the end, single-use bronchoscopes, Pantax Medical Developing the Freedom of Choice by Harold Hooper. Now I would like to hand over to the first speaker, Eric. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining in in this session. This is the title, so Infection Control in the Endoscopy Suite, Rationale and Risk of Contamination <coughs> um, is the issue that I would like to address. These are my disclosures. And, um, well, perhaps you do not recognize this as the exact spot, but this is uh, one of the, uh, well, reminders for me uh, personally and in our ward. This is the uh, sink of a shower in our ward where uh, last year a patient uh, was um, being treated for after a resection of a recurrence of adenocystis carcinoma and hysteresic wall 29 years uh, after a left-sided pneumonectomy and we were surprised by a carbama carbapeminase producing pseudomonas aeruginosa infection in this patient and um, started a, uh, a search from where he could have obtained this, uh, this contamination and this infection in our hospital. And eventually with using whole genoming sequencing and, and addressing the exact spots where he had been uh, treated after his surgery, we found that he, uh, uh, and published also that he was contaminated by a, uh, in a transmission by air. Uh, we've proven the relations uh, of the pseudomonas strains, uh, strains from these patients, but also from this uh, shower drain and eight patients' rooms, one sink and in an air sample. So contamination in hospital occurs and it may occur from very uh, particular and uh, unexpected uh, uh, places. And of course, this also raises the question on how clean our bronchoscopes are. And there uh, is an, in, in, uh, an increasing interest in this topic. And, and uh, I would like to review the, uh, the state of the art of the literature on this topic. And Many of the publications uh, uh, have been published by uh, Corey Ofsted, and she did a prospective study and uh, published it in 2018, uh, where she did direct observation of the uh, reprocessing methods in flexible bronchoscopies. So looking at manual cleaning, uh, high-level disinfection, and the assessment of storage conditions. And she uh, investigated 24 clinically uh, used bronchoscopes and found an astonishing high number of 100% of the bronchoscopes with residual contamination despite the cleaning processes. Not only contamination or residual contamination, but also microbial, microbial growth was found in 14 fully reprocessed scopes, so 58% including different uh, strains of, of microbacterial molds, stenotrophomonas, E. coli, Shigella. But also uh, she uh, observed the scopes uh, using a very thin uh, endoscope to check the, uh, the scopes inside and 100% of the scopes were damaged, had uh, retained fluids, brown, red, oily residues, scratches, damages of the insertion tube on the distal ends and filamentous debris was found and these scopes were uh, used for a mean of four years, but the variance between the uses of these scopes was 9.9 uh, .9 years to 11 years. And, and they also, she also showed that reprocessing practices were substandard in two out of three sites. Well, the question then is, are our bronchoscopes a source of infection? And uh, of course, well, I was 
inclined to say no, never this happened, never happens in my suite, but evidence for bronchoscope transmission, bronchoscopy related transmission is building rapidly with all endless uh, list of, of uh, mycobacteria and and uh, other, and pseudomonas serratia and all possible pathogens. And this uh, have, has led to an FDA release of uh, safety communication uh, on the status of microbial transmissions and infections after receiving 109 um, reports by the FDA. And um, it has become clear that non-adherence to the reprocessing guidelines is common um, and that visual inspection of damages is warranted uh, and implications uh, of these um, safety communications are profound, especially when you uh, know that many of these scopes are getting damaged. And if we compare it to erythroscopes, then 100% of these erythroscopes show defects after 19 times of use. And of the gastroscopes, 100% has damages within three months of use. Just the normal bacteria, or are we also at risk for a superbug infection? So several recent cases have been associated with cleaning of these high-level disinfected duodenoscopes, uh, which uh, has uh, resulted into a safety uh, um, uh, production from, uh, a, uh, from the FDA. And the uh, enteric bacteria, the, um, the, um, there's a lot of, of drugs that are um, very resistant to, to multi-drugs. So um, these have been found and, and uh, multi-drug resistant uh, organisms have been found um, repeatedly uh, and are a potential risk with a high mortality of up to 50%. So is bronchoscopy a risk for these um, uh, for these sub super box and, and is our reprocessing system essentially adequate enough to to kill these bacteria? Um, this was uh, investigated and recently published by Atul Mehta in the February's issue of Chest, and the details are on the next slide. So uh, investigation that. There have been 12 cases uh, uh, found and reported on uh, where bronchoscopy related um, resistant bacteria transmission has been identified. And in these 12 cases, the common denominator is that biofilms and damages are a likely cause. And a, another conclusion was that cleaning, according to the guidelines, may not be sufficient. And he identified uh, seven risk factors for transmission of uh, multidrug resistant uh, or microorganisms in the reprocessing process of bronchoscopes. Um, so if you do not follow the exact uh, uh, schedule, uh, failure of reprocessing bronchoscopes and the use the, uh, the reusable suction valves that have been uh, used in, are still being used in the Olympus systems, have been identified as a, as a risk. Um, damages, as I already told you in the previous slides, um, in a bronchoscope that fails the leak test is of, of course a, a big risk. Um, improperly maintained, serviced or repaired bronchoscopes are a risk. The use of bronchoscopes, including the reusable suction valve, persistently contaminated in, with an uh, associated uh, inaccessible biofilm. Um, use of bronchoscopes that have a manufacturing flaw or a design flaw are a risk for, uh, uh, for uh, transmission. And if you use third party accessories that, that damage the scope or make the uh, the uh, access to your uh, working channel loose so that becomes a, a sort of a a a gap in between that uh, that can hold uh, mycobacteria as well uh, but also the facility uh, uh, can be contaminated uh, the surfaces the uh, the sinks and the tap order that is being used for the reprocessing these are all potential risk factors 
Um, so there are lots of challenges in, in high-level disinfection of, uh, of our bronchoscopes, and there's mounting evidence of suboptimal uh, effectiveness of these high-level disinfection in practice. Multiple factors, um, so to reiterate, guideline adherence, damages, and use of blocking agents. So if you use something inside your tube, inside your scope, or on the outside of your scope that blocks the, uh, the uh, cleaning process. Uh, and the, well, in, in essential, the, the, the disinfection process is, is uh, the margin of error is much too high. So it's too complex to, to, uh, to have a good and solid process. So there's lots of steps that where you can, can um, miss a step. Then there's occupational health problems as well. So the, the people cleaning the scopes, they, uh, they report uh, very often that they have respiratory complaints and, and or physical discomforts and, and, and uh, go on sick leave even. Um, and there's also some indication that the, chemis the chemistry, uh, the, the stuff that you use to clean it may not be reliable enough to clean the scope. The, uh, the different systems, the minimum effective concentration may not be reached uh, in the, or the, the, chemi the, the chemicals are being used too long, all the potential risks. Um, so when we look into more detail in our high level disinfection protocols, well, uh, it kind of Remembers me of the uh, Boeing 737 Max, uh, and this could well be the equivalent for our procedures. And perhaps we uh, should uh, look at the aircraft manufacturer protocols to, uh, uh, well, to strengthen and to uh, improve our um, training, certification, and and checklisting for every cleaning procedure and and. Uh, uh, train our entirely involved staff uh, because, well, there is a, uh, a need for change. This is a very busy slide. So uh, Atul Mehta also uh, in his publication in, in CHEST 2020 uh, in the February issue uh, identified the unresolved uh, bronchoscope reprocessing issues. And um, it's a list of 10. And well, most of them uh, are uh, already addressed in the previous uh, slides. And uh, well, there are um, stuff to think about. And, and I would like to uh, urge you to read this uh, paper and study it and, and see how reprocessing of your bronchoscopes in your own um, uh, bronchoscopy suite is now, uh, well, performed and may possibly be improved as well. Um, and we're only addressing the, uh, well, the normal bugs and the normal uh, bacteria uh, until now, but uh, well, there's an, some more additional risks. So if you have more complex built scopes, uh, the increase of contamination uh, increases and there have been reports that the EVA scope is a potential risk with all the smaller uh, uh, gaps and, and uh, how the scope is built. That, may uh, increase the uh, risk of, of contamination. I haven't touched upon prions and virus and protein residues. I haven't touched upon viruses. Uh, and I haven't touched upon the risk for staff during cleaning and reprocessing, only uh, just uh, touched upon very shortly. But also the environmental impact of, of reprocessing is uh, a potential um, area that we need to look into in to more detail. Um, so but to conclude this part of the uh, presentation, it is possible, and I think it will be probable that there is an underreporting of the rate of infections, and the reprocessing guidelines are too complex, and therefore it's easy to make a mistake. It poses a risk for our uh, co-workers, uh, cleaning the scopes, um, we need to pay more attention in surveillance of our scopes and patients, uh, and, and potentially there may be additional safety measures uh, imposed to us uh, in line with the DNA scope regulations issued by the FDA. 
And for the, the engineering side, uh, well, perhaps uh, we should urge uh, the manufacturers to look at the design and see uh, if there are alternative designs possible for reusable scopes that facilitate effective reprocessing. And of course, this opens up the question if sterilization may be an answer, but well, if the damages still occur, does sterilization then answer the problem of, uh, of contamination or should we move to single use scopes perhaps? And we'll touch upon that issue later in this session. Thank you, Eric. I'm going to briefly review the possible role and possible applications of bronchoscopy in the COVID-19 pandemic. As you can see here, well, when talking about bronchoscopy in the COVID-19 pandemics, there are two key things that have to be kept into account. The first and foremost thing is that bronchoscopy is an aerosol-generating procedure, which is at high risk of spreading the infection to the healthcare staff. This is very important. And then we have to keep into account a number of clinical and organizational considerations that uh, um, need to be done before, during, and after bronchoscopy. As for the, the, the risk of spreading infection to the healthcare staff, uh, it is true that we actually do not have any information directly specific to bronchoscopy in SARS-CoV-2 infection, but we have many studies and the meta-analysis which was published in PLOS One in 2002 on the possible transmission of uh, the infection to the healthcare staff in the setting of SARS-CoV-1 infection. And as you can see here, uh, bronchoscopy is one of the procedures which is at high risk of transmitting this infection with an odds ratio as high as 1.1. As for the clinical and organizational considerations to be done before, during, and after bronchoscopy, um, there's uh, this very interesting uh, um, paper which has been published by Lenz and Colt in Respirology, which tries to summarize the recommendation issued by a number of uh, international respiratory societies. And there are two key considerations to be done first. The first one is that actually we would not have data, a few, if any, data on direct role of bronchoscopy in SARS-CoV-2 infection. And the second thing is that all the societies consider known or suspected COVID-19 as a relative contraindication to bronchoscopy, owing to the clear increased risk of transmission to the infection to the participating staff first, and we have already seen this aspect, but also because of the uncertainty of these diagnostic benefits. The importance of bronchoscopy has been suggested in the first part of the pandemic, but this uh, um, single study, which was published by Chinese authors and published in JAMA, in which the authors collected more than 1,000 specimens and submitted this specimen coming from different body parts to um, real-time reverse, uh, reverse PCR and look for uh, genetic signs of the virus. Uh, they showed that bronchalveolar lavage is the single procedure with the highest diagnostic sensitivity, which was as high as 93% in this study. The problem of this study is that this is not a comparative study, meaning that we do not know which would have been the diagnostic sensitivity of less invasive diagnostic tests in the patients who were submitted to BAL and resulted positive. And the second problem of this study is that only 15 bronchalveolar lavage hour of, out of uh, more than 1,000 specimens were performed. So bronchalveolar lavage accounted for less than 1.5% of the specimens collected and analyzed in this study. More recently, um, two Italian groups have published this research letter in the European Respiratory Journal, which questions the importance of BAL in this setting. What they did was to retrospectively analyze the uh, agreement between a negative upper respiratory uh, tract swab, at least one, and bronchalveolar lavage. The bronchalveolar lavage was performed in patients uh, who had clinical and or radiological uh, suspicions of uh, COVID-19 infection, 
in spite of, of them having uh, one or more negative upper respiratory uh, tract swabs. What they saw was that only two out of 79 patients with a negative swab had, uh, were found to have a, a positive BAL. So basically, the agreement between negative BAL, a uh, negative swab and B, negative BAL was 97.5%. And this obviously raises doubts on the role of BAL in confirming a COVID-19 infection when non-invasive upper respiratory tract swabs are negative. This um, table, which is uh, busy, but it's an interesting one because the authors try to summarize the, the recommendations made by the different scientific societies on several aspects of the procedure. The first one is the triage, and in particular, um, takes a note on the uh, indication of bronchoscopy in this setting, which are very sensitive, and I will talk about the indications in the next slide because this is particularly important. Then they focus on the procedure. And uh, uh, basically, what the societies suggest is that the, whenever possible, the bronchoscopy should be done in a negative pressure room. The personnel uh, in the room should be uh, limited at the most. Only essential personnel should be present. And if the patient does not have an advanced airways, such as a laryngeal mask of an endotracheal tube, the patient should wear a mask which should be slotted and um, slotted in order uh, the, the bronchoscope to be passed uh, either transnasally or transoral. Another key aspect is the personal protective equipment. And it is clearly shown that all the operators should wear gold, gloves, cap, a full face shield, and a mask which should be either an N19 or an FFP3 because these have the, the, the biggest filtering capacities. As for anesthesia, uh, it should, every step should be taken to avoid atomized or nebulized lidocaine, and the patient should be sedated in order to minimize the cough. If the patient is intubated and under general anesthesia, the societies uh, even suggest that the patient should be paralyzed in order to minimize the cough. As for the equipment, and this is very important, Eric van der Eyden will talk about this later. Uh, in patients with known or suspected COVID-19 infection, disposable bronchoscopes, single-use bronchoscopes should be used whenever available, and rigid bronchoscopy should be avoided because rigid bronchoscopy, as you know, provides a direct communication between the environment and the uh, uh, respiratory tract of the patient, which is obviously very dangerous. As for the ventilation, uh, Jet ventilation should be obviously avoided, and the closed circuit ventilation should be chosen in patients with an advanced airways in place. And finally, as for the post procedure, standard high level disinfection is suggested, but it is very important that we also consider the possibility to sterilizing the surfaces because it has been shown that the infection can be spread also by contaminated objects. And whenever possible, the reprocessing should be done in uh, locals which have a high number of uh, uh, changes of air per hour, at least 10 of, or 12. My last slide regards the possible indications of bronchoscopy, which are as follows. Inconclusive non-invasive COVID testing in patients, which is, is considered key to get to a final diagnosis of COVID-19 infection due owing to the gravity of the disease. The concern for an alternative etiology of respiratory disease, which would completely change the management of the patient. The suspicion of a super infection. The presence of a lower or a lung collapse concerning for mucus plugging. And obviously, a life saving uh, um, procedures or emergency interventions, such as those performed in the setting of massive hemoptysis or foreign body inhalation. So, my conclusion for this part of the presentation that bronchoscopy should, use, should be used sparingly in patients with known or suspected SARS-CoV-2 infection. And after, the, after a thorough analysis of the expected clinical benefits and inherent risks, clinical and organizational aspects which may limit the spread of the infection to the healthcare staff should be mastered and should be strictly followed. And from a diagnostic standpoint, it is important to say that, that we still do not actually know which is the role of bronchoscopy, which, because we do not have comparative studies of bronchoscopy with less invasive means of demonstrating the infection.
Um, I would like to uh, move forward to using a single use scope. Um, well, actually, there will be two talks, so uh, Rocco will uh, address the reusable scopes as well. I will focus on the single use bronchoscopes. And of course, well, the prerequisites for using a single use bronchoscope will be well, the first is that we do not want to harm our patients. In my previous talk, I have already addressed infection control, and this may be a, 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 a very uh, good option for here for to use a single use scope because it will be new and um, it will not have any defects. And of course, we do not want to fall, have a scope that falls apart, so it needs to be a safe uh, and sturdy scope. And if we want to look at using the bronchoscopes in diagnostic procedures, um, then it should have equal or better image quality than, than the current uh, diagnostic uh, scopes uh, we use. Uh, it should be compatible with the diagnostic tools that we use, so the biopsy forceps, for example, or all the other tools that we use. And it should be easy to integrate in the uh, current patient record file so we can share the images in the file of the patient and have our colleagues to, uh, have another look at it and show them what you've actually done. One of the big issues, of course, will be, well, uh, this is a, uh, a complex tool. Will it be cost effective to use single use scopes instead of a reusable scope that you can continue to use for many years before it will break down? And, and there have been some studies performed. Now, one of the earlier studies was already published in 2017, and it was in a US hospital intensive care setting. And they used an estimated 3% risk of cross-contamination um, and an approximate 21% risk of a subsequent infection uh, with a, a pneumonia. And they had um, they looked at the AMBU scopes that they could buy for $305, and they calculated the cost of a reusable scope per procedure at $221, and they have uh, used a cost of a ventilator-associated pneumonia of almost $30,000. So this is U.S. Uh, numbers. And the cost effectiveness analysis showed that uh, they could save $118 per procedure by eliminating 0.7% of the risk of infection using a single use scope. And um, their conclusion then from this study was that the implementation of the single use scope in an intensive care unit is a cost effective um, step in most scenarios, but they cautioned that there's not a lot of data to based this conclusion upon uh, with all the presumptions that they uh, they used. A, a later study that was published this year, and it just outside my image, it was published in Anesthesia by Mauritsen, and they did a systemic uh, review of uh, cost-effectiveness analysis uh, of reusable versus single scopes uh, in a perioperative settings. Um, and or this was a, um, a meta-analysis, a systematic review, and they uh, gathered all the reports of uh, cross-contaminations or infections followed to your usable scope in any clinical setting. 16 studies were included, more than 3,000 procedures, more than 2,000 patients, were, and they identified 487 contaminations and 87 infections. And they reported the incidence of cross um, Contamination in this uh, uh, in these uh, 3,000 procedures was 2.8 percent, and the costs uh, per use of a reusable flexible bronchoscope were uh, 276 euros. Uh, the costs per use of a uh, single use uh, flexible bronchoscope was 244 uh, euros, and the cost effectiveness of uh, the reusable cost per patients were 567. So there's benefit in using a single use flexible bronchoscope uh, in cost effectiveness, cross contamination, and resource utilization was the conclusion of this meta of this systematic uh, review and meta analysis. 
Um, well, expertise in using single-use scopes is predominantly gathered by uh, the uh, on the OR, on the ER and ICU units. This is a publication uh, by a German group uh, from Kriege, Trends in Anesthesia, from this year. Um, and they uh, just have asked the uh, colleagues from the intensivist, anesthesiologist, and internist in, in this uh, multi center study. Well, how do you like the scope uh, in terms of intubation maneuverability in the upper airway? Uh, for navigation purposes, if you go into the bronchial tree without using any tools, uh, the image quality compared to the image that you're used in your regular scope, suction capability and the potential. And, and, and the last question that they uh, had in their questionnaire was, could this uh, uh, re single use scope potentially replace the standard scope, yes or no? And um, the uh, results are that the, um, in a previous slide, but that has been moved. Um, so I'll just uh, try to summarize it for you, that the uh, preference for the single-use scope was uh, higher um, uh, in almost 60% for the diagnostic and therapeutic uh, uses, so 58% uh, and 65% uh, um, for an awake uh, uh, upper airway intubation. If you pulled the uh, data, then uh, we had the 60% um, preference of the uh, the single use scope. And the, uh, the single use scope that was used in this study was a uh, AMBU uh, 4 scope, A scope 4. Then the uh, next um, issue where the expertise is high is using a single use scope is the uh, uh, also, the AMBU uh, scope, where it was evaluated for intubation in intensive care. Well, based on uh, on these experience, well, I think most of you and uh, as I uh, have experienced the the advent of COVID-19, and this has uh, moved me to using uh, single-use scopes um, for COVID-19 patients uh, because of the uh, risk of contamination for the involved healthcare workers, myself and my uh, my uh, endoscope nurses, but also for the, the the people in the cleaning and reprocessing room, because you just throw away the scope and you do not need to uh, um, reprocess it. Where also uh, aerosols are being formed, um, and uh, the reduced risk of the uh, the uh, nurses does less handling uh, to uh, to prepare the scope. Another issue with the COVID-19 is that the single-use scopes are available inside the ICU. You can just store them in the, in the cabinet there. You pull open the, uh, the uh, sterile packages and, and start uh, scoping. And so it's just at, uh, uh, available inside the restricted area, so there's no need for transport in and out. And if uh, compared to using your reusable scope, you do not have to bring in your cards um, with the monitor and all the all the stuff that's on there and clean it going in and out. So it, it's time saving as well in terms of cleaning uh, in and out of the restricted area. So which scopes are available? Uh, the AMBU scopes are available. They're on screen here. So they uh, offer a different uh, Types and thicknesses, so 3.8, 5.0, 5.8, with uh, working channels from 1.2, 2.2, and, and 2.8. Um, and they're uh, being used uh, in our hospital on the OR by the, uh, for airway management by the anesthesia, and I've used them in the COVID uh, restricted areas. Um, Glidescope is also. Uh, producing um, uh, scopes, and, and many of your fellow anesthesiologists already know this firm because of the, uh, the uh, tubes that they use and, uh, and this make for intubation. So they have extended their, uh, their program with uh, bronchoscopes as well. And Neoscope is available at this moment uh, also uh, mostly being marketed for intubation. Uh, 
Um, and soon uh, will be available the uh, Pentax scope, of course, and this is uh, uh, something that we are waiting for, uh, for a, uh, a real bronchoscopy manufacturer to step into this area and uh, show them what is possible in improving uh, this area of single-use bronchoscopes. Um, so if we're looking at my list of prerequisites that I would like to have, well, we do like to have a good scope. And uh, well, this is a Pentax. Pentax has been in the uh, in the area for a over, over a century now, so it should be okay. Um, it should have equal or better image quality, and I had the opportunity to look at the uh, the prototypes and convinced that the image quality is is very good compared to our uh, compared to the other single uh, use scopes better and uh, well it matches the uh, the normal scopes. It should be compatible with our tools and suction, and uh, it, I think it's uh, the new scope will uh, address this as well, and it. Uh, it offers the opportunity to integrate it into your record filing system. So this is uh, on the single scope. For my part, I would like to hand over to Rocco again. I move to my last talk, which should uh, be um, to regard how to minimize the risk of uh, uh, infection and how to um, improve the reprocessing. Well, we actually know that the infection transmission through bronchoscopy is really a huge problem and a problem which has been probably under-recognized up to now. Um, this is probably also one of the reasons why uh, single-use scopes have been developed. Single-use scopes that up to the pandemic have been mostly used in the anesthesia and the ICU setting. And in this specific setting, as already Eric has said, microcosting analysis have clearly showed that single-use scope are, um, reduce overall costs as compared to reusable ones. Uh, besides ICU and uh, anesthesia setting, I have to say that uh, in the last years, we are uh, testifying a lot of improvement of single-use scopes regarding handling, performance, reliability, image quality, and increasing channel size have been involved in the development of the Puma One scope from Pentax, which uh, Eric has just uh, uh, cited. And I can testify the massive efforts the company has put into developing a top-in-class single-use bronchoscope. So things are moving in the direction of single-use scopes. However, I don't actually think right now we can turn directly to the use of single-use scope for every procedure, for at least two key reasons. The, the first reason is that most endoscopy centers, and especially the big ones, have already heavily invested in reuse, reusable scopes and relative processors, automatic endoscopy processors, and personal dedicated to reprocessing. So for these centers, the single-use scope does not reply, replace the cost of reusable ones, but is an added cost, actually. Uh, and the second reason is that for advanced bronchoscopy, meaning endosonography and guided bronchoscopy for the diagnosis of pulmonary neodymus, which is usually carried out with small bronchoscope, uh, having uh, uh, well-sized uh, uh, operative channels for allocating uh, uh, needle and forceps, still needs to be performed with reusable scopes because no such single-use scopes are available up to now. So what we need to do is to try and improve the process, uh, the reprocessing uh, procedure, which, as we all know, is a very complex multi-step process. And there's much room for improvement, as the literature shows clearly that many bronchoscopy are completely or partly unaware of the reprocessing guidelines, and the non-adherence to the international reprocessing guidelines is absolutely common. What is most scaring is that even in centers where the guidelines for reprocessing are strictly followed, outbreaks of infection sometimes caused that by difficult to treat bacteria have been reported and have been attributed in most cases to the presence of defects on the reusable scopes. This is a study which Eric van der Eden has already cited. And among other things, 
shows that visible irregularities in bronchoscopes are found basically in every reusable scope. This may contribute to cause the high rate of contamination and infection of these bronchoscopes. Again, from this study, this is a clear problem in a fissure in an ultrasound bronchoscope, and clearly this favors the accumulation of biofilm, which in turn may reduce the effectiveness of the reprocessing and may lead to the growth of bacteria. Or this other image, very interesting, shows the difference between a, the operative channel of a brand new scope, which is showed in panel A, with the operative channels of uh, used scopes. Uh, in panel B, you can see the presence of dents. In uh, uh, panel C, you can see a residual fluid. And in uh, panel D, you can see the presence of filamentous debris. All these uh, um, things can obviously favor the formation of biofilm and the growth of mycobacteria that lead to contamination of the bronchoscope, possibly to transmission of infection or pseudo infection to patients and to failure of the reprocessing uh, procedure. So what we need to do is to try and focus on the several steps of the um, reprocessing procedure. And I want to focus now, as we have not much time, on some steps which are always uh, thought as less important than others, but which are not import less important than others, which are drying, storage, and for procedures which are carried out outside of the bronchoscopy suite, the transport, the transport of the uh, sterilized or the disinfected bronchoscope. Drying in particular is extremely important because it is key to remove residual moisture and avoid biofilm formation, biofilm formation which is known to facilitate microorganism growth. There are three possible ways uh, through which uh, a bronchoscopy can be dried. The first one is uh, um, using drying cycles of uh, modern uh, automatic endoscopy processors, but this is a method which is seldom used because these cycles are quite long, so tend not to be used. A second method is uh, consisting in uh, drying the exterior surfaces of the bronchoscope with soft lint-free cloth, and then uh, uh, flushing the internal channels with medical air, mostly provided by an air gun. And the third possibility is to flash the scope channels with 70 to 90% ethyl or isopropyl alcohol, and then put the bronchoscope in a storage drying cabinet where in two or three hours, the bronchoscope is completely dry. As for the storage, most guidelines suggest, based on uh, very old evidence, that the endoscope should be under vert vertically in a uh, specifically uh, designed storage or drying cabinet. A drying cabinet is a cabinet into which forced medical air is uh, made circulate uh, um, continuously. And in these uh, cabinets also, there's a connection of the cabinet with the, the internal channels of the bronchoscopes in which high quality medical air is continuously uh, passed uh, in order to keep the channels dry. But very recently, a few uh, innovative technologies that allow for a perfect drying and uh, for a storage of uh, the scope or in, or in an horizontal fashion in order to spare also um, space have been developed. And I have to say that I use one of these uh, uh, new innovative technologies, which is uh, uh, very convenient and I want to show it. This is the, the so-called plasma typhoon and plasma bag technologies, which is shown in the image and occupies a very small uh, space. This allows for an ultra-fast and complete drying of the endoscopes, which takes less than five minutes, allows to store the bronchoscope, as shown in the image, in a, in a, in a bag, which is sterile and allows for a storage up to 31 days before the next reprocessing needs to be done. And these bags can be brought with, uh, um, with you in uh, whatever place you need to do bronchoscopy outside of the bronchoscopy suite without the risk of recontaminating recontamin the bronchoscope and then leading to infection to the patients. How does this work? This is a three-step process that takes the plasma typhoon to carry out this task. In the first step, a laminar flow eliminates the water out of the endoscope channels without liquid fragmentation. The second step 
uh, um, forecast that a, a turbulent flow with heated medical air completely dries the humidity within the internal channels wall. And in the third step, the scope is placed into the plasma bag, which is connected for uh, the last seven, six seconds with the plasma typhoon, which inflates into the bag before closure, uh, ozone, ozone which is known to be antibacterial and antiviral. So once this has been performed, the bag can be either stored or carried out in the hospital, wherever you need to do bronchoscopy. Some curiosity regarding the plasma typhoon and plasma bed. The plasma typhoon occupies minimal space, less than one square meter. This is the plasma typhoon at our reprocessing lab in the endoscopy suite. And this gives you this image gives you the idea of the, the, the space, the space it occupies as compared to the automatic endo endoscopy processors. The second thing is that the plasma typhoon comes with storage, storage drawers that occupies much less, less space than a, a storage cabinet. This is the, uh, the storage drawers that allow you to store up to six uh, bronchoscopes. And this is the um, comparison of the space occupied by the storage drawers as compared to our storage drying cabinet. And then you have the plasma bag, which allows you to bring the scope with you in the hospital without any risk of recontamination. So the conclusions, reusable scopes are still needed for advanced diagnostic bronchoscopy. Given the high and surely unrecognized rate of pseudo infections and infections caused by bronchoscopy, educational programs aimed at increasing awareness of the international reprocessing guidelines among interventionalists are indispensable. Audits regarding the reprocessing at each center should be carried out at predefined time frames to check for and possibly remove critical errors and probably problems in the reprocessing procedures. And technologies, technological advances such as the plasma typhoon and plasma bag will hopefully allow us to improve in the near future every aspect of reprocessing procedures eliminating the manual aspect and try to automatize and make it more, more uh, safe every aspect of the reprocessing procedure. Thank you, Rocco. Thank you, Eric. Um, I would like to end this uh, webinar with a quick presentation and explaining to you how we as Pentax Medical um, are going into the different challenges and tasks that are um, associated. So we would like to give you a little insight in um, how we actually, um, as Pentax Medical, as the manufacturer, are developing uh, what we call the freedom of choice. So right now there are many different solutions available regarding reusable scopes, um, and um, we think that adding a single endoscope to those different solutions would allow us to um, broaden up um, the possibilities for our customers. So. What is actually the task for us um, as a manufacturer? Um, and this is clearly about um, how can we as a manufacturer make an endoscope disposable? So coming from a very valuable um, product that uh, many of our customers have been using for years, um, it's actually our test in um, how to design the endoscope in such a way that um, it does not have to be reused for a thousand times, and instead, um, just use it for um, one single time. So quality components um, are at the same time a challenge for us, um, which means we have to reduce um, the actual use times of those components to have it just one time use, but at the same time, it's a chance for us. So we do not have to build it um, to resist chemicals to resist uh, multi-stress. So um, for us as a, as a developer, um, so it's a whole new perspective. And um, another aspect is definitely the performance itself. So for the performance, um, we, we do not want to have single-use um, scopes as an isolated solution. So to force our customers to go either into the direction of reusable scopes or either go into the direction of um, single-use scopes. What we want to have is to have single-use scopes um, as smooth as possible integrated in the existing clinical workflow. So they should not interfere with um, what is already there and um, what our customers are already used to. We would like to have them um, integrated in a natural way um, so any of the customers can take them and use them whenever they need. So the 
the whole point is um, the doctor should always be free to choose the best equipment for each patient. So not necessarily limiting to single use or reusable. Um, it's always depending on the situation. So all kind of patients and all kind of uh, medical procedures are different. And the doctor should be very free to choose um, the best equipment possible for um, the particular patient. So um, in terms of the design and the performance, um, it's the clear goal to be as close as possible to a reusable scope. Um, and from that perspective, like um, Dr. Van der Heiden and Dr. Trisolini kindly mentioned before us, uh, one thing is definitely the image quality. So um, you need a lot of experience um, and a lot of um, advanced um, image engineering in order to bring um, the image quality of a single use scope as close as possible to a reusable scope. Um, same goes for um, the mechanical properties, the IFT size, the dimensions, um, and all the different aspects of, um, of an endoscope that come together, like the angulation or, or the, the different um, diameters of the IFTs. From that point of view, you also have to have um, a lot of um, advanced skills in mechanical engineering. And last but not least, um, it's the control body. Um, many of our customers have been using um, the reusable endoscopes for, for years or or, um, or, or decades. So um, they want to have the same touch and feel of, of a real endoscope. So uh, not learning um, and uh, reinventing the wheel. So um, they would like to, um, when they grab a scope, um, they do not want to feel the difference. Um, and um, when they touch a single endoscope, it shall feel like an endoscope. So um, obviously, like we heard from um, Dr. Van der Heiden, is also a big point is, is about the cost. Um, and um, it's, it's very important that um, the single use endoscope um, needs to fit to the procedure costs. Um, so there are certain kinds of reimbursements, um, there are certain kinds of costs associated to uh, one procedure, and um, a single use endoscope needs to fit to this, um, not to be um, an isolated solution. And um, this means for us as, as the manufacturers and the designers, how can we reduce those costs? But at the same time, like I explained before, um, keep the performance in terms of image quality, um, mechanical and um, control body. So and um, the, our approach is pretty simple. Um, durability means at the same time complexity, this means cost. Um, so how we are approaching this is um, similar to um, something that you probably know from your private life, where um, you have a great design um, and this great design gradually just make it simpler. Um, so in that case, I put um, the peanuts um, because um, it, it pretty um, easy highlights um, how this approach works. So you always have the outer packaging. Um, it's basically the same. It's always um, um, the same yellow packaging here. Um, it's just simpler. But um, the content um, is still what you've been used to for years. So and when we think about the scope, um, the content, what you've been used to for years, um, we want to have the same image quality um, or similar image quality. We want to have a similar mechanics and we want to have a similar shape and design of an endoscope. Um, but the other packaging um, has been simplified. We have um, combined components um, in order to get down the costs and make it um, suitable to um, your cost procedures in the hospitals. So um, why would you then choose Pentax over the other um, possible solutions out there that um, Dr. Van der Heiden also showed in his presentation? Um, first of all, um, we know how to build the endoscopes. We know how to build the bronchoscopes. Since um, 1976, um, we launched the first bronchoscope in the market. And so since that, we know how to build bronchoscopes for more than 40 years. So we have a lot of experience in how to build those scopes we, and we know exactly what are the unmet needs um, and what needs to be inside of such a scope in order to make it um, single use. So um, having said that, we have a lot of um, expertise um, in our engineering facilities. So we have a lot of um, experts in image quality. We have um, a big department of advanced imaging. We have um, big departments of um, advanced mechanical engineering. So we have basically the expertise in-house to keep the design, but at the same time, make it single use. So, and um, another big point I need to emphasize here in this talk um, is we have a big network to clinicians. So we are not just um, designing something in a, on a theoretical way. 
So in this particular case, we involved uh, more than 50 physicians worldwide in the development um, of our Pentax-1 single-use bronchoscope. So we went out to, um, so here I put the picture of Dr. Trisolini, um, but many, many more um, we involved in the development. And it was not only um, the top um, doctors across um, Europe and across worldwide, we involved many different customers with different backgrounds and different needs. So in order to make sure we capture everything, um, not only somebody who um, has a very high um, quality um, work, but also people who do not use a scope very often, um, just have rare cases. Um, we wanted to implement in all those different aspects from image quality to, um, to the scope ergonomics, the different um, needs, different opinions. Um, so many, many different people were involved in order to design the scope. So, um, like I mentioned before, there are different clinical situations out there um, which require different equipment. Um, and we do not really want to limit our customers in their options. We want to keep this as open as possible, um, depending on each situation, each patient, to be very free in order to choose um, what they have. So right now we have a very broad portfolio of solutions already out there. Um, we see it, um, we have something for the drying and the storage, like Dr. Trisolini explained. Now we have reusable scopes like our K-series. We have um, semi-disposable scopes like our J10 series, which has is basically a reusable scope, but um, has um, semi-disposables um, of the critical components, like in this case, the valves. So um, for our broad portfolio of the solutions um, is just getting a new dimension with the single scopes. And um, with this new dimension, what we basically want to achieve is um, Pentax Medical wants to provide a freedom of choice to the customers. So um, no matter what kind of procedure you have, um, we want to really um, just provide the options and um, leave the decision up to the experts. Um, we do not want to tell you um, as the experts what to use in your procedure. We just want to provide um, something where you can um, choose out of a broad portfolio of different um, options. So, and um, whenever you pick a single scope or you're picking a reusable scope, we want to make sure that um, the touch and feel, the image quality, the mechanics are basically what you know um, from us as Pentax Medical Quality. So this was um, just in a nutshell explained how we are approaching this new um, technology. You see now here a little um, sneak preview around our upcoming scope. Um, and please be prepared for the upcoming months um, to get more additional information on this one. Professor van der Heiden. Thank you, Professor Tresolini. Thank you, Harald, for sharing your expert knowledge. And I thank you for the audience for joining the session. Are we live now, Harold? Okay.